All right, here we are again. Um, good to see you guys. Um, this is lecture number 38, program number 38, isn't it? Okay. Now, we only have this lecture number 38, and then lecture 39, and then we are done with the content of this class. You with me? Okay. So, we have this class period and the next class period to do chapter 11, and then we are complete with the content of this class. All right? So we're getting to the end of it, aren't we? Okay. Um, I'm going to put up one thing uh, here on the overhead real quick. Uh, for you folks here, face to face, here I'm going to go ahead and uh, just show this on the uh, Show this on the overhead while I'm talking. They don't need to see me. Um, if you are at home, go, you, can, you can pause this and, and copy it down. For you folks here, face to face, I handed this out to you, so I don't need to wait for you to copy it. Okay? But on the final, this is kind of a final review. Uh, let, me, let me pull that down a little bit more so you know what we're actually looking at. This is a review for the final. Okay. Um, I try to mainly hit the high points of each chapter, and, and it's like this is kind of what I consider the high points. And, and you might think, well, this just sounds like everything. Why don't you just make a page that says no everything? Well, there are actually some things. Like, let me give you an example. Remember lower of cost or market in chapter six? Do you remember that? That's not going to be on the final. It's not on the review sheet. It's not on the final. Is it important? Sure, but I don't consider that like a high point of chapter six. Okay. Now, if we had two or three or four homework questions over something, you know it's going to probably be on there, okay? All right? But this is kind of what I consider the, the high points of the um, final. Okay, again, you folks at home are, are pausing this and copying it, so I know I can move this down for you. Uh, let me back it up a little bit. We did not cover Chapter 7. Um... You do not need to know any of those ratios on the final exam, like the, you know, the inventory turnover or accounts receivable turnover or current ratio or anything. I'm not going to ask you to compute those, nor will I ask you to interpret them or anything like that. They're just not on there at all. Okay? Uh, know your accounting principles. Do you remember your accounting principles? Let me move this a little bit. Remember your accounting principles, your revenue recognition, your cost principle, your going concern, etc. Know those. I'd like to ask about those. At this point, you should know your account balances and which financial statement accounts are on. Okay? Have you guys? How many people have not yet made their note cards, but, but they are going to make those eventually? Okay, I'm just kidding. Don't even raise your hand. Um, you should know those things by now. All right? So that is that for the final review. You can start studying for that. Let's go ahead and any other questions on the final? Anybody? Okay. You folks at home, you know the window of time because I'll email it to you or, or it's probably in your syllabus actually, but the window of time when you need to take your final. Remember, the final can, everybody has to take the final and the final counts for everybody. It cannot be one of the tests. Nobody can drop the final. Okay? All right. The test that you drop, your lowest test score is one of the first four tests. Cool? All right. Let's go ahead and dive into our chapter 11 homework. I believe I assigned Quick Study 11.5 and Exercise 11.1. Is that right? Okay. Let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and do Exercise 11.1 first. Okay? Let's go ahead and do exercise 11.1 first. All right, so let me get my... Hey, can I borrow your pencil here or your pen? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, exercise 11.1. The following items appear on the balance sheet of a company with a two-month operating cycle. Okay? Identify the proper, classifi proper classification of each item as follows. Put C if it's a current liability, L if it's a long-term liability, or N if it's not a liability. Okay? <clears throat> Let's do that. Now, some of these we haven't talked about 
yet, so you would have kind of had to read in your book, but that's okay. Uh, number one, sales tax payable. What is that? That is a current liability. Remember, we, just, we define current liabilities and long-term liabilities as it's current if it's due within the next 12 months, it's long-term if it's not, okay? Uh, number two, FUTA tax is payable. Now that was something that we'll talk about a little bit today. That's unemployment taxes that the employer has to pay. That is current, okay? So number two, FUTA tax is payable is, is uh, current. Number three, accounts receivable. What is that? That's not a liability, that's an asset, okay? Number four, wages payable. Current, right? You're going to be paying them within the next year, hopefully a lot quicker than that. What about salaries payable? Also current. Do you remember the difference between salaries and wages? Salaries are for like you make $50,000 per year. Wages are for like hourly people. You make $15 an hour. Okay. Um, number six, notes payable that are due in six to 12 months. Current. Uh, number seven, notes payable due in 120 days. It's also current. Um, number eight, current portion of long-term debt. It's current. We're going to talk about that a little bit today, but that is current. Um, number nine, notes payable that mature in five years long are long-term. What about notes payable that are due in 13 to 24 months? Long also long-term. Okay. All right, any questions on those, folks? Alrighty, let's go to quick study 11.5, okay? Um, this has to do with short-term notes payable, correct? Alright, let me read this. On November 7, 2011, Ortiz Company borrows $150,000 cash by signing a 90-day 8% note payable with a face value of $150,000. Number one, they want us to compute the accrued interest payable on December 31, 2011. Then they want us to prepare the journal entry to record the accrued interest expense at December 31, 2011. And number three, they want us to prepare the journal entry to record payment of the note at maturity. Okay? All right, let's do that. Um, let me get my marker. Okay, the way we compute our interest, the way we compute our interest is we are going to take the principal of the note, which is how much? 150,000? 150,000 times the annual interest rate. And, and interest rates are almost always stated on an annual basis, okay? So when it says 8%, that's an 8% annual basis. So we take that times the interest rate of 8%, and then we have to take that times the proper amount of time, don't we? Okay? Now, um, let's talk about that a little bit. How many days did you count from November 7th to December 31st? Okay, most of you are saying 54, and that's what they got, but you got 55? Okay, here's the deal. I'm not really concerned about if you got 54 or 55 or 53, okay? On a test, I would say pick the one that you're closest to. Does that make sense? Okay, so you, if you did 55, you, you shouldn't, it's going to be off by a little bit, but pick the one that you're closest to because you're going to pretty, be pretty doggone close. Does that make sense? As a matter of fact, I'll ask you your answers for those of you who used 55. They used 54, but a lot of people are like, well, do you use the day they started on or do you, you know, they don't know where to go. I'm not really concerned about that, okay? But for our purposes, we're going to use 54, okay? Now, they divided by 360. Once again, if you chose to use 365, your answer will be a little different, okay? But on a test, 
you should just look for the answer that's closest to the one you computed. And if it's off by a little bit, that's fine. Okay, so if you take $150,000 times 8% times 54 divided by 360, what do you get? $1,800. Okay. Sarah, what'd you get if you used 55? 1833. Is that what you got? Mm -hmm. Okay. On a test, I would give you answers, and they would be different enough where the one that it was closest to would be pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you would, even if you got 1833, mm -hmm. just choose 1800. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. But usually you don't count the first day? Yeah. Because you, you, you'd go November, November 8th one day, okay. November 9th, second day, and so on. But. You know, when I go into a client, I want to make sure they've done, done something reasonable to put this liability on their books. Mm -hmm. okay? I'm not really concerned about dollars and pennies. Okay? That's not material. But I want to make sure that they have accrued a reasonable amount. Make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So that is the amount of accrued interest, right? So the journal entry we are going to make the journal entry that we are going to make is we're going to debit interest expense and credit interest payable for $1,800 on December 31st of 2011. Because we're going to show, let me cover up the rest of that answer. We're going to do our financial statements as of December 31st, 2011. And even though we don't have to pay that interest of $1,800 on that day, we need to show that it is a liability, and we need to get that expense booked into the proper period. This goes back to Chapter 3 in regards to adjusting journal entries, doesn't it? Okay? All right. Then they want us to say in Part 3, uh, what was the journal entry to record payment of the note at maturity? Okay? All right. Well, here is the entry right here. Did you guys come up with that? Now again, I do it a little different than the book does it. I like to always ask myself, what's the total amount of cash that I'm going to have to give them? Well, I know we're going to have to repay the principal of 150000 right? Correct? And how much interest am I going to have to do? Total interest. Total interest would be the principal of the note, 150000 times 8% times, this is a 90-day note, is that correct? Yep. Okay. And did anybody compute this out? That should equal 3,000, does it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what I say is the total amount of interest I'm going to have to give them is 3,000. Plus I have to give them the principal of 150. So my cash is going to be credited or decreased for 153,000. The note payable will be decreased by the principal amount of 150. And then I ask myself, okay, of that 3,000, how much has not yet been expensed but needs to be? Well, we expensed 1,800 of it. The other 1,200 needs to be expensed, correct? Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the journal entry is to reduce that liability because it's now been paid with cash. They always approach it a little different way, the way they come up with these. It's the same way. It's, it's, it's just different ways of coming up to the same journal entry. All right? Okay. Any questions on either of those? All right. Let's go ahead and, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Let's go ahead and go back to our lecture, and I think we will be able to finish up our lecture today. Okay? To finish up the lecture, I'll assign some homework and we'll go over that next time. All right, let's go. We are going to talk about payroll liabilities. Now, listen to me closely. You don't know how, you, you, should, be, you should be saying thank you, Professor Krug, when I tell you the following, okay? I'm not going to make you learn how to book a bunch of payroll journal entries, okay? Because it's really complicated. And that's not the main reason I'm going to do it, though. The, main, the, the other reason is, is because I don't want you to memorize all these formulas and max amounts and percentages knowing that they change every year. 
you understand what I'm saying? Okay. I'll tell you too, the chances of you do, doing payroll entries are probably pretty slim. A lot of companies, what, what are most companies doing with payroll anymore? Unless they're a large company, what are most companies doing? They're, outsour they're outsourcing payroll. Yep. So like paychecks or ADP or those, mm -hmm. okay? Most of the clients I work with don't even do their payroll anymore. Now I don't work with, I don't work with Sprint or Garmin. I'm sure they're doing their own payroll, okay? But if you outsource your payroll, a separate company does your payroll, and that could be a really good thing for several reasons. Number one, it's a great internal control because there's a lot of things that can happen bad with uh, payroll. You can not pay your payroll taxes on time or like I said we talked about internal control people can make up fictitious employees. Well you really don't have to worry about those sort of things if you use a payroll, pay, uh, a payroll company. And they have a lot of insurance if something does happen where you won't have to pay for it. Okay. Um, but it offers a, another person in the, you know how you always want to divide up responsibilities? For a smaller company, this is a great way to put a piece of the accounting in somebody else who's independent of the company. Okay, so you don't have to worry about internal control violations there. If it's a good internal control, then why don't bigger companies use it? Because surely they'd need it the most. You mean payroll? Yeah. Well, bigger companies do their own payroll. Bigger companies like Sprint, Garmin. Yeah, but why wouldn't they outsource if it's a good? Well, company? because they are large enough where it would be a really, really big expense. Okay. I mean, because they have like thousands of employees. Okay. But think about if you had a business. Mm -hmm. If you had a business, Matt, and you had five employees. Mm -hmm. Well, the way that this usually works is you have to pay a certain amount for each employee. You'd probably say, you know what? It's just not worth it to me to, you know. Okay. Have to have to do this just for five employees. It's just gonna, you know, have somebody else out there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of a, trying to think of an example. Um, let me see if I can think of one, off the top of my head. I really can't right now. <laughs> okay. Um, trying to think. I'm just trying to think of another analogy. It might come to me, and if I do, I'll, I'll tell you. That tell you that okay yeah. all right but we are going to talk about the general the general gist of payroll okay the general gist of payroll all right um, I'll give you an example I just came up with an example okay let's say that uh, let's say that you are a really small small company and you had certain legal things that needed to be done by a lawyer, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, chances are those things don't happen that much. So when you do, you just hire an outside lawyer. You with me? Yeah. You outsource it, okay? But let's say your company keeps growing and growing and growing and growing and getting bigger. Do you see at some point it makes sense to hire a lawyer that works at the company mm -hmm. to take care of that stuff because there's enough information that needs to be gone through with an attorney and it makes more sense and it's more cost effective to have an in-house counsel. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. It's kind of the same way with payroll. If you just have a few employees or even a few dozen or you know three or you know 50, 60, 70, 80, it may just make sense to just have somebody else do it. You have thousands, it's like okay we need to bring in our own payroll people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's your analogy. Is that a good one? Yeah. Awesome, okay. <laughs> All right, let's talk about payroll. Okay, now this is a concept that if you haven't figured out, wait till you start working. And you'll figure it out. But, and it can be kind of depressing. But when you get your paycheck, have you noticed that, that, that your gross pay, what you actually earned on the job, have you noticed that's different from your net pay? What? <laughs> yes. Amazing. Look at your paycheck stub. Okay. You, you know, if you, are, if you work 40 hours in one week and you get paid uh, 10 bucks an hour, just to make the math easy, then your gross pay is $400. But is your paycheck going to be for $400? No, it isn't. Okay? Because they have to withhold a bunch of different stuff. Okay? Number one, they have to withhold 
FICA taxes. And FICA is another word for, I mean, that's a, we also use, what's the other term we use? Social Security. Which you won't get, but this nice couple right here, you know why he is so happy and he's giving his wife a rose? Because he's saying, hey, that young generation is giving us a lot of Social Security money. Here's another ra rose, honey. And next, week, and next week we're leaving for our four-week cruise on the Caribbean, okay? So you've got to pay your FICA. You also have to pay Medicare taxes to pay for prescriptions for Harold and Dolores, okay? Then you've got to pay your federal income tax, okay? To help pay for the military, the postal service, the, the bank bailouts, okay? All that sort of stuff. Then you have to pay your state and local income taxes, correct? Now your state income taxes, those goes towards things like paying my salary. Thank you, okay? Um, some places you live, there's also a local income tax, isn't there? Like if you have the privilege of working in Kansas City, Missouri, there's a 1% earnings tax, isn't there? Okay. And then there might be some voluntary deductions. Now those might be things, those could be a variety of things, and just leave it on the PowerPoint if you would. Um, those could be things like union dues, or maybe you have told them you want to withhold money for a certain savings account for, for college for your kids, or maybe you give to the United Way or something like that. But the company is withholding, in that example, all this money because they've got to remit it to other people. They don't get to keep it either, right? I think this, is, this example is kind of humorous because up here it looks like there's three $100 bills, right? So would that, by my math, that's $300, right? And so when all this is taken out, then how much do you get? $1. You get $1, okay? Now that's a slight exaggeration. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. They withhold a bunch of stuff, don't they? Yeah. Okay. Now I'll try not to get too too many editorial comments or political comments in here, but this is a concept we all deal with, right? Okay. And as you make more money, they withhold more. Okay. If it makes you feel better, though, Harold and Dolores are really looking forward to that four-week cruise on the Caribbean. Okay. So, at least somebody's happy. All right. Now, let's talk more about this. For FICA, now again, I'm not going to ask you to memorize these percentages and maxes and all that because they're, this is for 2010. They're going to change for 2011 probably. At least these will. But FICA taxes, you have to pay 6.2% of the first 106,800 that you earn. Okay? You with me? So, most of you probably don't earn more than 106,800. I, I, I earn way more than that, of course. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so if you get above that, then you don't have to pay Social Security on, the, on that, that amount. The max you can pay out is, is 6622, okay? Now, you also have to pay 101.45% of all wages earned in the year to Medicare, okay? So that's one of the withholdings they do. So think about this. The company is withholding this money, but they're going to have to remit it to the proper agency, correct? So it's going to get booked as a current liability. That's why it's in the current liability chapter. You understand? And you can get in big trouble if you don't remit this money or don't remit it on a timely basis. That's the trouble you don't want to get into, okay? So that, this is, again, for employee. And you can see up here on the PowerPoint, this is for employee FICA taxes, okay? Um, and that's where you pay to the Internal Revenue Service. That's where the employers remit this money that they withheld. Now, there is also income tax. You guys know about that to the federal and the state and local, if there's a local one, okay? This depends on how many allowances you declare, what your earnings are, your tax rates, all those sort of things, right? But you're basically paying your taxes early. It always, it always humors me when on April 15th when people do their tax returns 
and they say, hey, I did my tax return. I don't owe anything. As a matter of fact, I'm getting $100 back. I think some of these people think that they did not pay any income tax. You see what I'm saying? That's not true. I hate to break it to you. You paid income tax. You just paid early and you paid $100 too much, so they're sending you $100 back. In a way, you gave the government a $100 interest-free loan, didn't you? Okay. So don't, don't be under the fault. And the government would like you to believe that, misnomer. Okay. But you're, you're, you're paying income tax. Okay. It's just that you pay it with your withholdings. And at, on April 15th, you figure out, did I pay too much? Did I pay too little? Do I owe a little more? Do, they, do I get a little refund? Okay. All right? If you don't earn a minimum, you get it back. You get you get everything yeah, back. Yeah, a, a real, real, real minimum. Yeah. If you have a full time job, you're going to be beyond that. There's something else too, though, because I get everything back, and I think it's just because I don't live here, which is kind of stupid. But well, because you're a, a a citizen of Great Britain, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and I don't want to go down that road because most people who watch are not citizens of Britain, but. Yeah, you're you're in a foreign country, right? Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, you're here you're here illegally, aren't you, man? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Can't, as the Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, what? Uh, no, you are here as a student, and you're right. There, there's some sort of things as far as you're not a citizen of this country, so you probably get your, your situation is going to be different than everybody else's. Okay. <laughs> and if you earn like if you are the at the poverty level or way below, you you may not pay any income taxes. I'm confident that. You guys won't be at that level, at least for long. Okay. So people are like, you don't know my situation. Okay. All right. Like I said, there's all also voluntary deductions in regards to things like union dues, savings accounts, pensions. Maybe you have to pay some of your health insurance, so they have to remit that to the health insurance company, charities. Okay. All this stuff that is withheld, though, employers are going to have to remit this, aren't they? Okay. And it will be a current liability. Now there is also employer taxes. What we were talking about before was employee things that they withheld from you that they have to record as current liabilities. Well, the employer also has to pay an equal amount of FICA and Medicare. Okay? So for example, on a paycheck, uh, on a paycheck for you, let's say your gross pay, oh, Jessica, let's say, you're, let's, say you, you, let's say you owed a total of $90 of Social Security tax and $40 for Medicare tax on a particular paycheck. That's what you owe. Now, I'm withholding that, and I have to give it to the right agency. I also, as your employer, have to match that. I have to also pay $90 and $40. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's expensive to hire employees, right? It's expensive to hire employees. When I had my own company, I didn't hire any employees for a number of reasons. Number one, I didn't trust any of them, okay? Because the company I was dealing with was information that would easily, I didn't, want, I didn't want to lose control of this information. And number two, I just didn't want to hassle with paying all these employer payroll taxes, okay? Unfortunately, that's the situation we get in. And unfortunately, you know, some people don't completely understand this. And they're like, tax the companies, tax the bigwigs, tax all this. Well, I understand what they're saying, but you have to also understand there comes a point where people say, you know what, we're going to get rid of some of our employees. It's just too expensive to hire employees, right? It's too expensive. Or we'll outsource them. Let's outsource it overseas, okay? And we don't have to do all this stuff for outsourced employees, okay? So, and then, of course, Employers, not employees, but employers have to pay unemployment taxes. This was the, the FUTA, SUTA, FUTA and SUTA. Remember we talked about that in our homework? They have to pay unemployment taxes. Okay. Now, our, you, United States, I just read an article this morning where there is so much unemployment being drawn because there's so many people unemployed that we're starting to run out of unemployment money, aren't we? It's a real problem, isn't it? Okay. All right, let's talk about multi-period known liabilities, okay? Now, you can kind of read about this section in your book. I'm going to simplify it a little bit, okay? Um, 
and you can read that on the slide. I think it's kind of being more confusing than it needs to be. Here's the main concept I want to get across. Let's say you have a mortgage payable Let's say you have a mortgage payable and your total mortgage payable is 180,000. Let's say this is on an office building or something that your company has. Okay? So you have a mortgage payable of $180,000, okay? Now let's say 2,000 of that principal, not of interest, but 2,000 of that principal is due within the next 12 months, okay? And the other 178,000 is not, okay? You with me? Well, the 2,000 of principal that's due within the next 12 months, that would be in your current section of your financial statement. And that would be called the current maturity of long-term debt. And then this long-term section would be in the long-term liabilities of your balance sheet. You with me? So you could have this one mortgage payable of 180000 and some of it's listed up here in the current section and the other section is down here in the long-term section. Okay? And what you might see is, like I said, on, in the current liabilities you'll see current, current portion of long-term debt and then in the long-term section, it would say long-term debt, net of current portion. In other words, we've taken the current portion and moved it up to the current liability section. Make sense? Um, you know, the same thing with any sort of long-term liability, okay? And uh, let's say that you bought a three-year subscription to Reader's Digest and you, pay, you prepaid for three years of Reader's Digest. Do you see where part of that unearned revenue would be current and part of it would be long-term? The part for the, the, current, the unearned revenue for the next year that they're going to pay off by sending you magazines, that would be in the current section, and then there's a long-term section for the second year and the third year. Does that make sense? All right. And this is all important because people who read your financial statements are very concerned with what your debt is, aren't they? Think about if you're going to loan mo potentially loan money to a company. You're very concerned about what they owe, right? If you've ever filled out a credit card application or an application for a loan, they want to know how much you owe to other people, right? And for companies, they want to know how much of this is current, it has to be paid in the next year, how much of this is long term. So this is a very important section, okay? All right, going back to the PowerPoints. There's also sometimes some uncertainty in liabilities. We don't maybe know who we're supposed to pay or when we're supposed to pay or how much we're supposed to pay, okay? Remember the Gulf oil crisis by BP Amico that occurred several years ago? I think that occurred in the fall, didn't it? Okay. I think it occurred. But anyway, think about the first time they had to release financial statements. They know that there's going to be a ton of lawsuits in regards to this, right? But they don't really know who you're going to have to pay. They don't know when we're going to have to pay. And they certainly don't know how much they're going to have to pay in lawsuits, do they? But that's very, very relevant as a reader of the financial statements, wouldn't it be? So this is like, how do you handle that? How do you handle a liability where there's a lot of uncertainty in regards to it, but yet knowing that it's very important to the reader. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. A lot of times what we'll have to do is we'll have to estimate it. And an estimated liability is it's a known obligation of a certain, an uncertain amount, but we can reasonably estimate it. Okay? Now we're going to talk about the lawsuit example um, in a little bit. Let's talk about some times where we know for sure we're going to have to pay it, but it's an, um, an uncertain amount and we can reasonably estimate it. One of these examples would be warranties, okay? Warranties. And this kind of has some of the same principles as when we did receivables, 
Remember when we did receivables? And we have these receivables, and we know some of them are not going to pay us, but we don't know exactly who's not going to pay us, but we can estimate it. Well, this is the same way with warranties. What is a warranty? That's the obligation of the seller to replace or correct a product within a specified period. Okay? So let's say you sell automobiles and you have a, you have a one year full warranty. Well, if you sell a $30,000 vehicle, you know, there's gonna you know there's a certain percentage that you can estimate that's going to be warranty expense, right? And they want to make sure you book that warranty expense in the same period as you booked the revenue when you sold that car. Thus, we have to estimate it, okay? For example, they say a dealer sells a car for $32,000 on December 1 of 11 with a warranty for parts and labors for 12 months or, or, or 12,000 miles, excuse me. Now, from past history, the dealership experiences an average warranty cost of 3% of the selling price of each car. And this is just something that through the years, you know, this is a good estimate. Okay, there's lots of estimates in accounting, okay? So what do we do? Well, this is the, this is the journal entry, not for the sale of the car, but for the, to book the expense the, and the estimated liability in the same period as when we booked that revenue. 3% times 32,000 is $960. So we debit warranty expense, get that expense booked in the same period, and we have an estimated warranty liability of $960. You with me? This is, that journal, this is the journal entry that we have to make in this regards. Now remember, there's some uncertainty in this, right? This is an estimation. That's okay. Lots of estimates in accounting. Then let's say on February 5, I'm sorry, February 15th of 2012, that person comes in not even, not even three months later, and they need $200 of parts and $250 of labor. Well, that doesn't sound like they bought a very good car. But the journal entry we would make there is we would decrease our estimated warranty liability by $450. What would we credit? Well, for the parts, we would actually reduce our auto parts inventory by $200. And then for the labor, the $250 of labor, if we weren't going to pay it right then, we would have to accrue a salaries payable of $250. Are you with me? Now, this, this is, let's say that this is the only repair, and this is $450. Well, that doesn't equal $960, does it? But when you do an estimate like this, you, you really don't think that every car you sell is going to have 3%, right? You're just saying all of the auto sales we have 3% times that is a good estimate of what our warranty expense will be. There'll be, some, there'll be some cars that have a lot more than that, and then there'll be some that have no, nothing. You know, you know what I'm saying? So it's an estimate as far as for the entirety. Okay? And you can monitor that estimated warranty liability account. Maybe you're estimating too high. Maybe you're estimating too low. Okay? Just kind of like bad debt expense, right? you're going to use the history of the company to kind of to help you prepare your estimate. And when I, go in, when I would go in as an auditor, I would look at these sort of estimates and I'd say, is this reasonable? Okay. If we had to, could we, could we validate how we came up with this and why we're using it? Okay. So that's for warranties. Oh, uh, I think we're going to end there. Uh, yeah, we're going to end there. We're going to end with warranties. And so the next class period, here's what we're going to end up doing. Um, you are going to, we're going to talk about some, some new stuff in, the, in this lecture next time. And then we're probably going to do the homework in that class period too, because next one's the last one, right? Okay. But if you can, please read about the section on contingent liabilities in your uh, textbook. Okay, read about contingent liabilities in your textbook. All right? And then what we talk about next class and learn about will make a lot more sense. All right? So read about contingent liabilities and
Let me give you your homework. Well, you're not going to have much. That's okay. You can start studying for the final. Okay. The only homework that you have is Quick Study 11.8. Okay. Quick Study 11.8. Read about contingent liabilities. We've got one more class period of contents of this class, and that's the next one, number 39. All right. See you guys. Thank you.